and organic cereals. I'm thrilled that you could join us today for a really fun HOA. Um, Dr. Dean Layton and I have been putting together just our brains and racking them for ideas to make weeknight dinners easier and also think about how a really well-stocked pantry can help you out in a lot of different ways. So um, maybe before I introduce Jean, um, I'd love to share why we're talking about this. Um, you know, May is a really special month for a lot of reasons. You know, it happens to be the month of Memorial Day weekend, which who doesn't love that? There's another holiday, Cinco de Mayo. But on top of that, um, it's Celiac Awareness Month, and so what we wanted to do was really take a step back and have a really different approach to talking about living with celiac disease, living gluten-free, um, and really the idea that a gluten-free lifestyle doesn't have to involve highly processed foods. That's one of the reasons why we even entitled this particular, sorry, that's one of the reasons why we entitled this particular HOA building a whole food organic pantry because we feel like those are really good um, building blocks and from there you can make just a slew of different meals. So that was the reason um, for this HOA and um, you know, I think just a quick intro about Air One. Air One was started by macrobiotic educators in the late 1960s. They were looking to get back to the source of where food comes from and so they even took the name which is from the novel of a Samuel Butler um, book Air One was a utopia where people took care of their health based on what they ate. So if you've ever tried any of our cereals, you'll see that the ingredient lists are really short. They involve ingredients that your grandmother can, would understand and that you yourself can pronounce. And they are definitely minimally processed. So we um, just believe in natural fortification and so we're not like adding any um, interesting or strange ingredients in there as well. So um, that's a little bit about who we are as a company. So now I want to just kind of turn things over to Jean a little bit and introduce you to the Gluten-Free Doctor. Hi, Jean. Hi, Annalise. Hi, everybody. I am so glad to be here. Uh, it's so funny. When I first started writing my blog, it was actually called Gluten-Free Organics at that point. But that was seven years ago, and um, that was my goal point but there were no products, not a single one, out on the market as a gluten-free and organic product. And I guess Air Huang must have started up like right after I did my web search because they've been around for so long. But I ended up changing my blog name to Gluten-Free Doctor because that's what I am. I'm a naturopathic physician who is gluten intolerant and our, my whole family is gluten intolerant. And uh, we went gluten-free about seven years ago, almost eight, um, and life changed. Uh, my daughters were seven at the time, and we took them gluten-free because they had stopped growing. And my husband was celiac, and I was gluten intolerant, and we realized the genetics for this amazing twin pair were um, not in their favor. So we took them gluten-free, and... They grew an inch and a half the following month after we got them 100% gluten-free. So everybody's got their own journey towards why they choose a gluten-free diet. Uh, for some people, it's biopsy and blood work and um, 15 doctors in their diagnostic stream. And for others, it's um, they're making a personal choice. And quite honestly, as long as you eat organically, non-GMO, healthy food, it's all good food. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit of your story. I think that's always so important, especially, um, you know, from our perspective, since we make nine certified gluten-free cereals um, that are all non-GMO verified by the non-GMO project, um, I definitely have gotten different inquiries from our customers who are newly diagnosed. and. Um, that was another impetus for this particular topic because what I have found is that there's a sense of being completely overwhelmed. I'm new, newly diagnosed. What can I eat? And being able to kind of help fill in the blanks. So that's that's definitely. Um, it's, it sounds like it's a big part of your story too, actually. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when people first go gluten free, they're in grief. That's the, that's the reality, is they are grieving a big loss. Because if you look at standard food that most people eat on a daily basis, it's all got wheat in it. 
you know, there's bread, there's pasta, there's pizza, there's waffles or pancakes, you know, any kind of treat meal has, you know, sweetbreads or cake or, it just, people have to take a big deep breath and take a step back and go, I don't have to have pastry or pasta or flour-based food for every meal. And what I do with patients the first week or so is I'm very gentle with them because it's such a big shock to go into a supermarket and have to do that celiac twist of, is there wheat in this? Is there rye? Is there barley? You know, what are we going to do? It's far easier to say, shop the perimeter of the store. Look for the organic fruits, organic vegetables, look at dairy if you're not dairy intolerant, you know, um, plain meat, plain fish, those are, without any kind of seasoning, those are naturally gluten-free. Eggs, a fabulous source of protein, even for vegetarians, not for vegans, but, um, and then keep going around the, the perimeter of the store getting the least processed foods. Because things that don't have packaging don't have gluten. Yeah. Unless you're in the bulk aisle, and we'll talk about that. But if there's no packaging, you're probably pretty safe. You know, unless you're chewing on a wheat stem, uh, you're not going to be getting gluten. So. And one thing that's I think pretty great is that a lot of retailers actually are starting to bring nutritionists in house, and. A lot of retailers, um, so wherever you're shopping, um, definitely check with your store with the customer service desk and see if they actually do gluten-free tours because a number of stores actually either have a gluten-free section or perhaps they have labeling on the shelf if the gluten-free products are with all of the other products. But in addition to that, you could very well end up um, getting to take a tour and learning about foods that you might never have tried before um, that might become new favorites. And look for gluten-free food fairs, um, at least in, in my geographic area. I'm up in uh, Whatcom County, Washington, so I'm up at the Canadian border. Each one of the different stores holds a gluten-free food fair where they bring in the vendors with samples, sometimes with coupons and giveaways, that kind of thing. But it gives you the ability to go into a store and, and just try all sorts of different cereals or um, milk one one store did a milk sampling you know because when you need to go to a, an alternative milk it's like which one do I start with it's the same thing with a lot of gluten-free foods and for people who are trying to eat a whole food diet sometimes those gluten-free food fairs are highly processed products but sometimes they're not you know you'll see brown rice or rice and bean mixtures you know Lundberg's has had a fabulous new um, four kinds of beans and two kinds of rices and it's the kind of thing you could just stick in your crock pot and be done you know you'd have a great vegetarian meal right there um, so keep an eye out for those things as well and the other thing to the gluten-free fairs that's a chance for you to actually get to interact with the manufacturers face to face and if you're familiar with their products you can ask them questions um, perhaps you've never tried their product before and you get a chance to actually um, not only try the product, but you can turn it around, look at the ingredient panel, look at the nutritional panel, and see if that kind of aligns with um, the dietary choices that you decided to make as well. Yeah, because for so many people, uh, shopping becomes a, a challenge. It takes you twice as long to go shopping when you first diagnosed, because you have to stand there and pick up every box and go, okay, What's in here? Oh, brown rice, brown rice syrup, honey, and salt. Okay, I can eat this, but can I eat something that has maltodextrin in it? And there are great posts available online that talk about all these additives where you're really not sure where they're coming from. Um, if you eat an organic diet, you will have a better sense of where these products are coming from. But... I'm a big fan of, I try to avoid anything that takes my science degree to speak it. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's my theory. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. So, 
Shall we talk about our pantry staple heroes, Jean? What do you think? Absolutely. People need to know what's there. So I think the idea here is that when you look at your pantry, and believe me, I have recently um, remodeled and remade a pantry. Um, if you look at it, it usually falls into the different food groups. So we would love for you all that are involved in the HOA, um, post your pantry staple heroes so we can kind of call them out and we can talk about them and then we'll share some of ours. So, Excuse me, one sec. <coughs> I just want everybody to realize that we're drawing comments from both the event on Google Plus and the YouTube channel. So feel free to drop in comments at either place and we'll be able to pull them into the event. But to kick off, for um, my pantry, we moved about a year ago, and I had to create a pantry in a closet, which is always interesting, because I have 25-pound bags of flour, because I bake all the time. Um, and so I had to, to create some safe storage for large quantities. And then there's the more typical things. So for me, I keep now, um, in the year since we moved, I've actually acquired a grain mill. Um, I have a fabulous Nutramill flour mill. So now I keep all whole grains instead of the flour, except if I can't grind it myself, which is a couple of them. Um, and I keep them dry and sealed because as long as you keep them dry, sealed, and not in heat, the closet's not hot, um, that's all it needs to store for over a year. Uh, you can keep grain a really long time. So uh, I have one daughter who, their family of four, um, our, food, <laughs> our food allergens. Um, my husband can't do soy as well as gluten. Um, we're all gluten-free. He doesn't do soy. He doesn't do tomatoes, and he doesn't do potatoes well. So those are minor food groups for us. And one daughter um, would love to be vegetarian except for bacon. She just can't resist bacon. So she'd like to be vegetarian. So we do a lot of vegetarian food. Um, and then she gets her bacon occasionally because we get fabulous organic grass-fed bacon from the local market. Um, but that's how I keep my grain storage. And I use my uh, flour mill to be able to create my flour blends. And um, then I, I have a couple of other tools. We'll, we'll talk about tools a little bit later, I think. What are your heroes? So here's a question I have for you about your grains. Do you keep any of your grains? And specifically, I'm thinking of flour. So 25-pound bags obviously don't fit in the freezer. But I've actually heard that you can extend the life of grains, and that's a good way to just kind of keep them from I don't know, going rancid in the well, freezer. Yes, absolutely. And if you were in a hot uh, climate, when I was living in New Jersey, and I, I wanted it because it's humid there, I wanted to keep things in the freezer because the humidity level could start things molding. Um, when we lived down in southern Oregon where the weather got up to 113, yes, I kept flowers in the freezer. And when you freeze a flower, especially if it's a whole milled flour, so brown rice flour or millet flour, where the grain has its bran coat contained within it, um, those will turn more rapidly. So you do want to keep them either in the freezer or in the refrigerator. And, you know, buy what you need. I buy 25-pound bags because um, I write. And because I write, I have to produce a lot more food um, when I'm testing. You know, I might test a recipe seven or eight times before I'm absolutely certain it's going to turn out every single time for someone. Uh, that's more food than most people eat. But my neighbors love me. So. Cool. Can we? Can I address this uh, first question that's been put up? Absolutely. I don't know if there's a way for us to share that on screen, but um, the question is: What's your favorite dairy alternative? Almond, coconut? Do you prefer? And is there a difference between shelf-safe almond rice or coconut milk or the refrigerated? And so, what I would say to this is: It really depends on how you're going to use it. Because I definitely love coconut milk in soups. I think it's really nice. Um, I like it in even with like kale or spinach uh, to do kind of like a creamed 
spinach, there's a really good recipe that Bryant Terry has of, uh, it's kind of like a sog tofu, mm -hmm. so it's like a, a vegan dish, it's really, really good. But with the almond milk, this is what I would share with you, is that almond milk is super easy to make at home. Um, all you really need is one, one tool, well, two tools. Um, essentially, you put one cup of almonds into a bowl, you fill it up with like about an inch of water over the top of it, leave it overnight so that the almonds get nice and soft and so they've been soaking all night long. Next morning you're going to drain out the water, you stick those almonds into your blender and then you'll fill it with four cups of just fresh water and then you essentially are going to puree that until it's smooth. So then blender is your tool number one. Tool number two is going to be a nut milk bag and so those bags are kind of like shaped a little bit like that. And so what you'll do is once you've blended the almond milk, you'll pour it through the nut milk bag into a bowl and you'll kind of hold it at the top and start kind of milking it so that you're getting all of the pulp in the bag and then you, all you're left with is creamy, wonderful milk that doesn't have any additives. The milk is usually good for three days and I, I tell you, I make it from scratch all the time. You can add a little vanilla extract to make a vanilla almond milk. Um, if you want it sweet, you could add stevia, you could add a little agave if you use either of those ingredients or you could even um, use a soaked date or two. So that's th those are my ideas. Jean, what are your thoughts on favorite um, dairy-free alternative milks? To be honest, I make my own almond milk just as you described. Um, actually, I don't use quite as much water because I create kind of an almond cream. Mm. Um, and I do have a, I do have a um, high-speed blender. So I let it run till there is no texture left. Um, it does get warm, but it also makes it so that the uh, almond cream is incredibly stable and it'll stay in my fridge for about five or six days. Um, so that's what I drink, that's what I use. I use, I rarely reach for the refrigerated um, packaged milks any longer and that's for two reasons. The first reason is I can't locate any that don't have carrageenan in them. And carrageenan is a gum product that's derived from seaweed and there are some concerns in medical literature about too much exposure. And when I'm using an alternative milk, I'm using it every single day. So I hesitate to to add to any toxic burden if I can help it. And I like my almond milk that's just almonds and water. So for me, I'd much rather take a minute every, you know, or maybe two minutes every four or five days and make myself my almond milk. Um, I do use the little tiny brick packs when I travel because I discovered that finding almond milk anywhere <laughs> is really kind of tough. But you can take one of those individual brick packs and freeze it and then keep your lunch cold as you travel. It will go through TSA if it's frozen. So that's how I manage to keep my lunch cold because, of course, I travel with food, right? I'm gluten-free. can't eat most of the airports and that kind of thing. And the brick pack stay, keeps it cold. And I have my almond milk on the other end of the trip. Um, I use coconut milk, organic coconut milk, in the can uh, frequently for people who, well, my husband adores coconut milk. We make curry as one of our fast dinners at least twice a week because it's as simple as, you know, all the vegetables we want to eat, some tofu or some chicken or some whatever, protein, a can of uh, chickpeas and a can of coconut milk and dinner's on the table in a half an hour. Um, and that's one of the recipes that even my daughters are very comfortable going, okay, I'm making curry tonight. So you know, when your 15-year-olds can, can cook, it's great. Um, I don't use any of the other stuff. Uh, you know, all those alternative milks in boxes are great for camping or, you know, when I lived 45 minutes from a supermarket, yes, I always kept them then. But now the supermarket's around the corner from my house, so I'm willing to go walk and get my almonds instead. 
Cool. Thanks, Megan, for the question. Um, so, other pantry staple heroes. So let's talk about meat and proteins. Um, I find that one of my pantry staple heroes is black beans, dried black beans. And I love garbanzo beans. I can run through those very easily. Same thing with lentils. Um, you know, and I would say in addition to that, we always have a just lots of jars of nuts. So there's always some cashews, always some almonds, some walnuts. Um, those those tend to be the ones that I that I really like to reach for. Um, they're so versatile. I think that's part of it. And you know, just the fact that you can use that in everything from making um, granola from scratch uh, using Erewhon cereal, or you could even um, soak it and then use it to make a dairy-free alternative to a cream sauce, like with cashew cream and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I find that those are great. And lentils cook really fast. I think that they're just kind of, um, they, save, uh, they save the night sometimes, just in terms of getting dinner on the table very quickly. But um, oh, yeah. 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 What about you, Jean? What are some of your, uh, your proteins that, that you uh, are your pantry staple heroes? Um, I too, well, I gosh, I must have seven different colors of lentils. Um, I because I we like Indian food. Um, my husband adores the combination of spices for Indian food, and lentils literally you go from dry to completely cooked on the plate in a half an hour. Um, well seasoned and everything. It's they're just so fast. Um, so I have I have the lentils and then I do keep uh, organic canned beans in my pantry simply because I will forget and even if they're frozen which is the other way I do it I tend to make a large batch of beans uh, typically on a weekend and then I'll freeze like one cup portions but even if they're frozen sometimes it takes a little bit longer for me to go find them and stuff so I do keep some canned um, Protein wise, otherwise I have every nut you could possibly imagine and all the seeds. So we have pecans, walnuts, almonds all the time and I buy huge bags um, because one of my daughter's favorite snacks is roasted nuts. So anytime the oven goes on they'll just smooth pecans down or almonds down on a cookie sheet. Don't They don't do anything else to them. They don't salt them. They don't sugar them. They don't anything. They just toast them for 10 minutes and then they put them aside and that's the they just got home from school and they're starving snack. You know they'll grab a handful and you know, they're 15. They can handle it. They're athletes. So um, me I have to make sure that I only eat like 10 at a time because they're so good that way. But it also gives us the roasted nuts for on top of things. So we'll make lentils and serve it over rice with just some toasted cashews, and that's a perfect dinner. Yeah, I think that's our. Otherwise, I do keep canned um, salmon, and I keep canned tuna, mm -hmm. uh, both of which you know I I am incredibly fortunate to be in the geographic area we are in. Um, salmon is literally right out of Bristol Bay because the fishermen who sh fish Bristol Bay come right into Bellingham. Um, so we can buy the fish right off the boat. And the tuna, uh, we, have a, we have a buddy who goes tuna fishing. And so there's a tuna canning party <laughs> every year. And we get to watch the whole thing. So um, I try not to do a ton of tuna just because all tuna has a certain amount of mercury but yes we do have both of those in our pantry. So maybe let's move on to whole grains. Um, what are some of your pantry staple whole grains? Because I definitely have a few in my arsenal. Um. <laughs> well especially because I have the flour mill I have probably the, lar <laughs> the largest collection. Um, brown rice, organic brown rice, or um, organic jasmine rice, organic sweet rice, um, and then I do carry, I, I do have in my pantry a few non-organic rices just because I can't, they're, they're clean rice, they're clean sources, but organic doesn't exist. So I have black rice, I have sticky Thai rice, I have red rice, um, that's just the rices. And then I have millet, 
both hulled and unhulled. I like the unhulled, but it's hard to find. Um, and so before you go on, let's talk about millet because millet's kind of amazing. Would you agree? It is absolutely. I, millet is so easy to cook, and it, I mean you have beautiful, tender, golden grains within 20 minutes. I mean it's it's so small that it cooks so quickly, um, and I use millet. In anything, I, you know, I, I have made millet pilafs to substitute for any kind of rice. Um, I make millet bread, so I start out from cooked millet and then make bread from that. Um, millet, I love millet. Millet's contained within my flour mix, so that when I'm baking, there's always whole millet in not there's whole millet that's been ground in my mix. Because the golden color, it, so much of our gluten-free food is just white. Even if we are using like brown rice flour, you grind it and it's tan white, but it's white. The millet adds that kind of underlying prettiness to it. So to me, it's what you need in every meal. <laughs> Well, so that's why I have the untold. <laughs> I would definitely say a millet, you know, I think it's it's a great substitute if you want to make couscous um, because it's such a small grain and just like Jean said, it cooks so quickly. But I think one of my favorites and to your comment about the fact that a lot of the gluten-free grains are very white, let's talk about buckwheat because buckwheat, while it's not a grain, it's a pseudo cereal, at the same time it's fantastic. It gives such a great toasty, roasty flavor to any food and it's that really lovely deep shade of brown. Well, and you're talking about um, roasted buckwheat. Kasha, right. Right. So I have both kasha because of all the, what you just described. I mean, you know, any of the, the meals that need a deep undertone of flavor, that's when I reach for kasha. But I keep green buckwheat as well in my pantry, and I use green buckwheat to help provide structure. Because if you grind green buckwheat and use it, to make bread or pasta or anything that where you need some stickiness, the green buckwheat acts as a binder. Hmm. You can get organic green buckwheat, thank goodness. So you don't have to depend on things like xanthan if you don't want to. Well, and we make we make a buckwheat and hemp cereal that's really fantastic and you know, I think that's definitely like a pantry staple in my house. I like the fact that it's just got a little bit of maple syrup, so it's not super sweet, but um, I actually used it to make fish sticks, so it's a really fantastic kind of crispy breadcrumb replacement, so you're getting actual nutrients, not just um, kind of the empty calories and nutri <laughs> nutrient-less um, quality of a lot of white bread, breadcrumbs, and even gluten-free white bread. But um, it's great that way, and I think even um, we have an apple... It's really good apple crisp where that's used as the topping as well. But uh, yeah, the buckwheat and hemp is great. And buckwheat, um, if you were to make a big batch of it on a Sunday, you can use it in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that I think it's all, always great, especially during the winter time, is actually to have a big bowl of kind of porridge. So you serve that up with one of the non-dairy milks that we were talking about before and add some dried fruit and some nuts. And man, you will have a breakfast that stays with you. Yeah. Yeah, I I even make the buckwheat um, when when that's my intention that it's breakfast. I take my um, crock pot, which is a big oval crock pot, and I fill it full of jars, individual jars, and put the buckwheat in the jars so that my daughters, as they're dashing off to high school and can't eat breakfast because there's no time, um, I throw in the milk, throw in the I, I've even gotten it hot with um, boiling water to reheat them and then add some dried fruit, the hot water rehydrates it and they have a breakfast that's going to stick with them as they run out the door to catch the bus in the morning. You also happen to mention that Fiona has a personal favorite in your household of Air One she, she does. I have to be honest. This, okay, she's 15 and she is um, an athlete. So she opened this box of cereal yesterday, <laughs> and that's all there is left. She eats huge quantities of this. I think it's the berries, because the berries are whole and beautiful. They're not little bitty uh, flavor sprinkles. They're, they're 
a whole bite of fruit. So, yeah, that and she, when I let her have marshmallows, which happens often enough, these make the most incredible Rice Krispie treats. Mm. So we make our marshmallows. So, so let's answer another question because I think Amy Tracy has a good one that that is a. We might need a little bit more information, Amy, but I think this is probably something that you're not alone in struggling with. So she says, I really struggle because I have a husband who won't eat what I have to eat, so I find I'm making two meals. He wouldn't eat any of the foods you were talking about. I'm at my wit's end. Any suggestions? Well, you know, there's always personal preferences, and that's a tough place to start. But there's normally common ground, too. So if he's kind of a meat and potato kind of guy and he doesn't want to eat your vegetarian whatever, you can cook him a piece of meat and the vegetables can be mutual. So that you're only making one batch of whatever the vegetable is and then you provide the grain for you and, well, if he has to have a baked potato, you can do that. Um, but I look at meal components and how they can be combined for different people's needs or desires. You know, I have, my, one of my daughters will only eat ground meat. She won't eat a piece that's identifiable as muscle. So when I'm making a meal and the meal involves a piece of meat that looks like a muscle, she just goes vegetarian. And I keep in my fridge pre-cooked tofu. And, and I get these huge slabs of tofu at the, um, the cash and carry, which is a restaurant supply. I get a two-pound slab of organic, ultra-firm tofu, and it's only this thick. It's only about an inch thick. And I just brush it with uh, coconut milk and a little bit of curry paste and roast it in the oven for 20 minutes. And then I have this already made, already seasoned, um, great protein source, and that's what goes into her meal. And everybody else eats what we want, but that's what goes into her meal. It also makes the world's most amazing filling for um, to, uh, to sushi. Like we'll do California rolls. We'll make California rolls and tofu and avocado and some pickled vegetables. That's the combination. So what about, here's, here's an idea. Um, my husband loves to eat burritos. I don't eat burritos, so, and that's not a bad thing. It's just, it shows kind of like our preferences and our differences. Um, but it would be very easy for him if he wanted to have a burrito and actually have a big tortilla that's enfolding all of it to just make a burrito bowl or include certain ingredients, exclude others. You know, I think even, I almost wonder if something like a sweet potato um, bar as an example, just something where it's like everybody kind of gets to add their own toppings, but the bulk of the actual cooking work um, remains pretty pretty much the same across the board. I almost wonder if something like that would work. I don't know what your um, what your allergies or avoidances are specifically, but um, but I'm just wondering if that would be a way where kind of both can win, and you don't have to like necessarily like make a whole second dinner um, for him or for yourself. Yeah. The, the other thing I do, not just to address personal preferences or other allergies, is I like to make as much food at one time and then use components of that food over two or three days. So when you cook like that, when you're doing a bulk cook, you know, you roast off the tofu, you make seven, you know, for my house, I'll do a dozen baked potatoes at one time or I'll do an entire tray of sweet potatoes and just bake them off and then if there's a situation like that there's a, a filling option that can just come out of the fridge and be heated you know um, and even in my microwave less house it still gets dinner on the table in just a few minutes so. thanks for the question Amy I hope that helped a little bit okay so um, let's why don't we move on? Let's talk about yeah. shopping for organic um, whole food pantry staples. It doesn't have to break the bank because I think sometimes when people hear organic foods, they think expensive. So Gina and I have kind of like put together some different ideas of how you can shop for whole food products um, that are organic and just not necessarily have to break the budget. So um, do you want to do you want to uh, talk about 
maybe one of your ways that, that you do that, Jean? Well, the first thing I do, especially when we're talking budget, is I make certain that the foods that I'm choosing or to eat organically really need to be organic. I mean, in the best of all possible worlds, I would love to be doing 100% organic all the time. But that's, you know, seasonally, that's not always easy. So I do look at the Environmental Working Group's list of the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And anything on the Dirty Dozen list is what I am absolutely purchasing organic, no matter how expensive it gets. And the Clean 15 are where I will start to play a little bit with, well, if it's local and I can talk to the farmer at the farmer's market and he's not certified organic, but he's done all the work to be safe and clean and not use pesticides, I'll do that. Um, the other thing I do is I look at places that I can buy the quantity my family needs for two or three months and get a bulk buy. So either by going to the supermarket and asking, or there's a group called Azure Standard, and you can create drop sites and be buying from the same company that supplies co-ops typically. And so if I know that I eat a 25-pound bag of rice every three months, which is actually stretching it, I think we do it every two, um, I'll purchase that in a bulk form and luckily enough I have space to store it. Now if you live in a little city apartment that may not be the best but um, the other way you can look at it is go into your supermarket and see if they sell things in a bulk bin situation. Sometimes that's the way to both purchase smaller quantities and keep it organic. The thing you have to watch for then is do they maintain those bulk bins with safety? Because if they're putting the wheat flour up above your brown rice, you're going to get some wheat flour in your brown rice whether you want it or not. And that would be a situation where it's far better to spend the extra 50 cents or whatever it might be to go get the brown rice in a package that's sealed in a gluten-free facility. Because being sick just because you're trying to save money is a terrible solution. And sometimes, like here's an example. Um, the other day I was shopping in the bulk bin section and I was looking for nuts and the nuts were um, one price and then I happened to walk into another aisle where they actually had the pre-bagged nuts and the nuts over there were actually cheaper so sometimes it also helps to kind of um, do a little bit of investigative work and kind of see what the pricing is in different parts of the store. I would say in addition to that some of the retailers actually have um, one day sales where you can save on a specific item and buy it in mass. I know that I personally get pretty excited about that when kombucha goes on sale, but um, you know that could be another way to to save money. Um, and then outside of the bulk bin section, and this would be kind of geared more towards manufacturers, um, as an example, if you were to go onto the Air One Organic website, at the bottom of the home page you can sign up for the newsletter and find out um, any sort of special promotions we're having with retailers. Um, there's even a coupon you can download on that home page, but in the newsletter, that's usually where we actually will put our savings, whether it's a promotion code for the online store or if it's a coupon to print out to use in store. That's something to be looking for um, with, with us and also with other manufacturers whose foods you like because at the end of the day, kind of keeping in touch with what they're doing, that's a good way to find out what sort of savings you can find um, that, that they're offering right then. So, Absolutely. Any, you know, if you know what product you want, you should always Google coupon code and the product name because you never know when there's an actual coupon out there that'll save you money on great cereal or salad or, you know, I, every single time I know I need to do a decent buy of anything, I will go check because you know, somebody's going to have a coupon and it will save you that dollar or whatever it is. Um, the other thing is, I know some people are not comfortable with it, but store reward cards frequently will get you coupons in the mail based on your shopping pattern. So the Kroger store near me is called Fred Myers, and because I have a rewards card and I go in and I shop, 
I routinely get uh, coupons dropped into my, my mailbox for Bob's Red Mill, for Erwan, for salad, for, um, you know, all these routine purchases, I see a coupon frequently. And sometimes it's as, as simple a coupon as, you know, 10% off a produce buy or $2 off of a fish buy or, you know, they're not even held to a particular item. They're just a, a you know, a topic within the store. Uh, here's, an, here's another idea too, and this is one that maybe, um, <clears throat> maybe you do this already and maybe you don't, but actually shopping online. So for some people, they actually will um, do a lot of their shopping online because they find that the prices are more competitive um, if they buy it in bulk. As an example, on our on online store, um, shop.attunefoods.com, there is not only um, a case break discount that's offered on the cereals, but there's actually a recurring order program. So if you know, like as an example, Jean's daughter who loves the honey um, rice, it's the honey crispy brown rice with mixed berries, and she goes through it that fast. Let's say Jean doesn't have a store near her that actually carries it. Well, she can sign up to receive um, shipments of that cereal. So it's kind of more of a con convenience thing rather than just a budgetary thing. But at the same time, Time is money, and so sometimes that can be really valuable, especially for, you know, we find our customers that are based in towns that maybe don't have um, a lot of natural food stores, co-ops, or Whole Foods as options for the cereals. But, um, you know, Amazon.com, Prime, that's another one that I know, you know, our customers do shop in quite a bit, and, you know, I think that also gives them both the convenience and then potentially also that price break. So sometimes online shopping, in terms of doing the research and really investigating where to get the best price can be can be worthwhile. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I use Amazon.com frequently for exactly this cereal um, because only one store in town carries it, and I routinely clear the shelf. And no matter how many times I've said to them, um, "Can you just order an extra case?" They don't. So I use Amazon. Uh, yeah. You know, because it drops onto my front porch. I'm thrilled, you know. And the other thing about Amazon is they have a lot of gluten-free foods. So if you want to be able to sample something that you don't have access to, you can get one or two from Amazon and try the product, you know. And then, then you can be a good advocate and walk into the store manager and say, I'd like to buy this all the time. Please stock it. And they'll say, I will look for you. Because that's the customer they want. They want somebody who comes in and says, I want this. Yeah. Stock it. So, Jean, you mentioned earlier the uh, EWG uh, Clean uh, 15 and the Dirty Dozen. Um, do you have a graphic of that that you could share? I think I do. Hang on one second. Because I have to say, I have that magnet. It's, it's stuck on my refrigerator, and it's... Definitely my reference guide as far as, again, kind of where I need to buy organic for sure and where I can sometimes save money by buying conventional. And well, you, you know, do you know they have an app? Ooh. They have an app. So if you have a smartphone like, you, like I do, um, I use their app. But this is their Clean 15 Dirty Dozen. It's pinned on our um, Pinterest board. And so sweet potatoes, cabbage, pineapple, grapefruit, cantaloupe, peas, eggplant, those are things that don't have pesticide traces. And so buying them conventionally is a way of extending your budget. But things like strawberries and cucumbers and celery and bell peppers, tomatoes, spinach, grapes, hot peppers, um, they're all high trace pesticides and you want to go organic for them and of course we're going into salad season so how many of these things pop into everybody's salad it's um, yeah. those are the ones now I have to admit that frequently enough I will go to a farmer at our farmers market I'm very lucky we have a farmers market that is here every Saturday and then there's a second one that happens on Wednesdays so I can actually go get fresh produce straight from the farm twice a week all summer long. And I'll ask the farmer, you know, because if I'm getting peas from a mile up the road, I can talk to him and say, do you have to spray? If you do, why? And how often? Is it in, 
Is it when the seeds are just coming up? Is it when they're in blossom? Is it when the fruit or whatever vegetable is actually on the vine? Because all of that tells me what likelihood there is of me ingesting any pesticide. Um, and there's a ton of certified organic farmers in our market too. So that's always fun. So let's maybe kind of wind things down a little bit. Let's start talking about an easy weeknight workflow because I know that for some of you that came, that's really what you're looking for. You've got to get dinner on the table and it's kind of a stressful experience sometimes to try to figure out, okay, maybe your day hasn't quite gone as planned. And so, you know, I think that part of this conversation about uh, building a whole food organic pantry with these great gluten-free pantry staples, it really does lay these um, great building blocks to being able to turn out delicious, nutritious, and easy dinners um, on a dime. So, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk through that, Jean. Well, here's where tools become important for me. Um, I do not have a microwave at my home. I only have one at my office so I can heat up a lunch. Um, for a lot of reasons, I've made that choice. So the tools I use every day or every other day are my rice cooker, I have a, a Zerushi rice cooker. I have a food processor that I'll use at least once a week. And I have a crock pot. And then, of course, there's all my pots and pans and that kind of thing. But between my crock pot and my rice cooker, I have dinner on the table every single night within a half an hour of walking in the door. Um, the Zerushi rice cooker, the way they work is they have a uh, container that goes into the heating vessel and you fill it full of your rice or what I do is I do pilafs. So I put rice, I put sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds, uh, millet, um, sometimes more than one color of rice, sometimes I'll throw in some lentils. Anything that's about the same size will cook at the same rate. And then you cover the grains, whatever you have, with about a three quarters of an inch of either water or I'll sometimes throw in almond milk or coconut milk um, or vegetable broth. And then you close the lid and you turn it on and within 20 minutes you've got beautiful rice. Now, if it's brown rice, it does take a little bit longer. So I learned, <laughs> I have one of those timers that you can set, you know, like to turn on a lamp when you've gone away for whatever. Um, I have one of those in my socket and then I plug the rice cooker into that. So I set it all up before I go off to the office and it turns itself on at 4.30, 5 o'clock, whatever time I've set. And I come home and that component's done. So that's no, heavy. Yeah, no really work heavy. at all. Yeah. And that's the way I can do the, the brown rice. Because brown rice does take 35, 40 minutes, no matter what you do. So those are my, that's my first tool. And the crock pot, I'm going to talk about more, but you, you should have the tool in there or an idea. Because um, the crock pot for me is staple. I will typically, um, you know, I see Sundays as like a really good day to kind of get things going. If, if you were to come into the kitchen and look at the countertop, you'd be like, mad experiments, mad scientists, what's going on? But essentially there's usually a bowl of beans that have been soaking overnight, so I usually get a big pot of beans going. On, um, on a Sunday evening since we're not 100% vegetarian at all. Um, we're more flexitarian in that regard. Um, usually on Sunday nights we'll also roast a chicken and we can kind of use that and whether it's shredded or we can um, use larger parts of it to incorporate into other meals. But I think to the point that Jean was talking about earlier as far as bulk cooking, that really does help even in terms of I find, um, you know, for people that work outside of the home, it's you could even potentially put all of your lunches together in separate containers on a Sunday. So all you have to do is grab it and you're ready to go. But as far as um, dinner, you know, man, the, all the different ways that you can make brown rice look different from that one batch, it's actually kind of fun. It really stretches your creativity, but um, that's definitely one of them. And then just, you know, having fresh produce in the crisper, so that usually will get prepared on the same evening, but there's a lot of prep that can be done in advance. Um, here's here's one that I actually just did 
two days ago, and I, I think it's fantastic. So it's getting like little plum mushroom, or sorry, plum tomatoes, and you slow roast them. So they're almost like candy. So you're essentially making sun-dried tomatoes, but they're oven-dried tomatoes, which are awesome. Um, you do it with a little bit of olive oil and some thyme, and essentially they become that umami kind of secret ingredient. So um, I ended up putting those in a sauce, just kind of whipping together a sauce in a high-speed blender with cashews, raw garlic, lemon juice, um, a whole bunch of chives, and some olive oil, uh, a little bit of salt and pepper. And it made this really fantastic, um, how do I want to describe it? It was kind of like a sundry tomato pesto almost, but during, um, during lunchtime or dinners that need to be really kind of put together quickly, I find that they're called hippie bowls, which I think is a disservice, but essentially it's a whole grain, greens, beans bowl. And you can vary that. You can roast different vegetables and add those to the mix. You know, I put that sun-dried tomato pesto on um, a bowl that was brown rice, black beans. It had some goat's milk yogurt on top, um, some fresh spinach because you want to have something that's really vibrant and just, I don't know, that always adds something to it, right? Um, a quarter of an avocado and some of the pesto and, you know, you just kind of like mix it all together with roasted carrots and it's a fantastic bowl that's really satisfying, it's hearty and because I've done all of the prep of those ingredients earlier in the week it's very easy to put together. Yeah, yeah it, the cooking ahead portion of life really saves you on the weeknights you know and when I have those beautiful baked sweet potatoes, you know, and I can dice those into a scrambled egg mixture or I can just take them and shred them and pour them over pasta with a little bit of olive oil and a lot of sage and, you know, it just makes life so much simpler. But the other tool I use so often that it lives on my counter even though it eats up a third of it is my crock pot. And the, the idea of the crock pot being both a, a way of having something simmer all day. So this is how I make beans happen in my house because I don't remember typically that I want beans till the morning. So I'll just rinse off any dry bean, put them in the crock pot, make sure there's double the amount of water over the top and put it on low and just let it cook all day. You know, they don't get mushy, they get tender. And then I come home and I've got this whole beautiful container full of nice hot beans and I've got the rice pilaf done on the other side and then I go looking for my sauces because I will make like that sun-dried tomato pesto that makes all the difference in flavor so I make sauces my husband is an incredible cook as well like in me and he goes into all these amazing Asian sauces or Indian sauces so our the back of our refrigerator is full of chutneys and and pickles and fermentation products and sure. uh, we just dump them the hippie bowl is what we eat most nights because we just dump it all on there and the nice thing about having all those in the fridge is if you prefer an Italian twist for the night and somebody else wants to go Indian you know you do the same beans and rice but you add a different sauce and it goes a different direction that works really beautifully. Um, what I do do with the crock pot for daytime is uh, the like the buckwheat. I will do canning jars, the, you know, the pint-sized canning jars, and fill them like a third full of grain, and add in dried fruits, and then top it with whatever the milk is, and just put the the disc portion of the lid on, and then fill around all the jars with water. So you created a water bath and allow that to cook overnight. So if I want oatmeal and, and Fiona wants millet and Katie wants buckwheat and Ed wants something else, we'll each have our own, our own jar. You put the ring on it and out the door you go. And it's hot. So that's a wintertime basic in our house. And you can season it. You can add a little sweetener if you feel like you really have to. Um, but I tend to go savory. I'll throw in like fine herbs and a little bit of olive oil and go go savory for breakfast. So do you catch something that both Jean and I are talking about? Is we're even <clears throat> talking about these weeknight um, 
dinner savers, we'll call them that. You know, she's talking about oatmeal, she's talking about millet, um, even dried fruit. So those are all pantry staples. They're they're just there. So if you just have them regularly on hand, then you can kind of play around with it. You know, for these hippie bowls or the kind of beans, grains and greens bowls, you know, it's the black beans, the dried black beans, it's the um, the brown rice that's in the pantry, it's the olive oil, you know, the different spices. So all of those things, by stocking your pantry and just being really thoughtful about having it, it's going to help you out in the long run as far as being able to just um, maneuver some really awesome meals. So. We are coming to the end of our chat very soon, but I know we have a few recipes that, um, that we, we talked do. about in advance. Um, yeah, we put up the pictures in advance. That's true. And, and I'm going to go back out, but I wanted to, to show people. The other thing is, don't forget to have treats in your pantry. So I know it sounds really decadent to have 14 kinds of salt, but, but in my pantry, I have 14 kinds of salt because my husband adores the different flavors of all the different kinds of salt. So we have smoked salt, we have pink salt, we have sea salt, we have everything under the sun. Have those treat ingredients because that can change the hippie bowl into something truly transcendent. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is if you have the best quality, you will enjoy your meal more. So go for that incredible uh, chocolate or whatever. This is this is Christina's recipe, right? This yeah, is so in. Christina from uh, the Spa Betty. This is her chickpea. So it's a it's called I think it's actually really fun. It's a plan words, but it's a chicken patty. So it's plant based protein that's soy free and essentially what she's doing is she's using chickpeas, she's using quinoa to make these really fantastic um, plant-based burgers essentially and then she rolls the outside of them in the cereal to give it a really nice crunch. So here you see it on a gluten-free bun and she's made a vegan sauce. There's a tomato, avocado and it's on some really beautiful kale. So that would be a really wonderful dinner and I think that her recipe actually makes probably 10 or 12 of these, so you'd have several of them to spare. That's the kind of thing you could make a whole batch and then be able to um, eat them for a good portion of a week or take it and go a different direction with the next flavor because if you top that with a little bit of tomato sauce and a um, little bit of mozzarella cheese or cheese substitute, you could have a great time with it like a like a cutlet, like a chicken cutlet. Okay, so let's see what the fun part of being screen share person is getting it up. Here's the other one. This is Amy's recipe. That's the chicken. Yeah, so this is this is Elisa Fleming's oh, sorry. actually. No worries. It's um, so. This is a curry chicken nugget. Now, who would think to put curry into the chicken nugget? But I actually like the fact that it already imparts some really wonderful flavor. Again, this is using the cereal as kind of a breadcrumb replacement, but it's it makes a really fantastic um, just dinner protein where you know exactly what's going in it, so it doesn't have any funny ingredients. Um, you know, if if chicken tenders happen to be something that you prefer, you can actually cut the chicken in a different way or actually just buy the, the tenders um, cut in that particular uh, form and you can, you can make them that way and so then pairing that with a really wonderful sauce, even like a chutney, could be really delicious and just an easy, easy dinner. So very, very quick and easy. And if you want to get your child to be adventurous in their food choices, Start them off early and it will be as simple as they they're it's familiar, you know, for an awful lot of kids, their whole life of not wanting to eat is because they never got exposed to it. Yeah. This one is amazing. This is figs. Yeah, so this is a fig and walnut tart with a no bake crust. And it uses the cereal as part of the crust with, I believe, dates and maple syrup. But it's not 
something that's very difficult. Um, as you can tell, it's really elegant. So this would have been great for Mother's Day. It would be even great for upcoming Memorial Day weekend party. Yep. Yep. This one is, that's a treat. And because it's naturally sweetened, it's also, you know, it wouldn't be the world's worst breakfast. Mm. You know? It, it, because it doesn't have a ton of sweetness. Now, where's that last? This is, I'm on the Pinterest board we created for the, um, for the event. And this is all pantry ideas that we've pulled from all sorts of different places. I'm trying to find that fourth recipe that we pinned in the board. Look at this. You can make your own sriracha. I love it. Love it. Oh, right there. Right. Serve it to the left. Again. There you go. Oh, sorry. It's not the one I was expecting. I was looking for the dish. Um, this one is chickpeas with the so topping is the cereal. Yeah, this is a creamy, comforting chickpea bake. And it's pasta. So just imagine if you were to even, going away from even, just kind of giving this as an example, but let's say like you made a macaroni and cheese. You could actually use the crushed cornflakes, I find makes a fantastic, just little extra crunch. And so that's exactly what's happening here. And this particular um, pasta bake, Man, can you imagine tasting this in the wintertime when it's cold outside? There's peas, chickpeas, and then this really wonderful creamy dairy-free sauce um, that's kind of holding it all together. It's just, yeah, it's one of our favorites. Yeah, that's a complete meal in one pan without any concerns of people feeling deprived. That would feed everybody. Yeah. yeah. There's nobody who would hate that. So, yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Megan. Thanks for your patience, Megan. Um, she says, you mentioned going organic for the Dirty Dozen. How do farmers market produce items compare? Do they need to be specified as organic? It's a good question, Megan. It's a great question, Megan. Um, the reality is organic is a defined term. It has a legal definition. And so if a farmer is using that term, they have to... Uh, have sourced their seeds organically, not used any pesticides or herbicides that are inorganic in nature. So they have certain things that they can use for pest reduction, but they are naturally created sources. So they use you know, BT instead of oils and that kind of thing. Um, they have to have tracked every application of every pesticide on the crop throughout the growing season. And it ha they have to have all that paperwork certified in order to declare, be declared organic. They also have to be doing that for three to, f I think it's three years on every crop. And for some crops, it's five years. They have to have that growing pattern before they can be declared organic. So there's actually a brand out there that, said, that calls itself Tomorrow's Organics because it's that transition period. They can't say they're organic, but they're not using anything. So um, some farmers market farms are in that transition period where they're transitioning the land itself to organic uses. Um, the farmers will be incredibly proud, and they will tell you the entire thing if you ask them. Um, for other farms, they're just tiny. They're small farms, and the paperwork aspect and the fees that are involved make it financially a challenge for them. So for a lot of the farms um, in rural areas, the farm itself is too small to support the fees they have to pay, but they, all, they also follow an organic standard. So you, this is where you get to go talk to your farmer. Go find the people you want to buy from and ask them. And the answers to those your questions will tell you whether or not you want to eat that food. I have fabulous farmers. I, 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 Whatcom County actually produces most of the raspberries for the world. <laughs> and, and we're high on apples and blueberries and strawberries come in. So when I want to go do you pick, because that's how I fill my freezer in the winter and save money, um, 
I will go and find the no spray or the organic transition and purchase from those farmers. You know, that way my choices in spending my money also go towards what I ultimately want to see in the world. You know, I want to not use petroleum-based pesticides. That's my big goal. So. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Megan. And as we're just again wrapping things up, if you have last-minute questions, this is the time to please just add them to add them to the feed while Jean and I keep talking. So yeah, should we should we give them our surprise? Sure, let's give them the surprise. <laughs> so since people were here for the event, there is a bit of a surprise which is so much fun. I'm going to share two different things. First of all, this is How Can It Be Gluten-Free Cookbook. So there's the Gluten-Free Pantry Staples. And Annalise, can you please tell them how they will access that? Yeah, so one of you is going to win um, the cookbook. So this is America's Test Kitchen. They just have come out with a fantastic How Can It Be Gluten-Free cookbook and it's been getting really rave reviews but essentially it kind of gives you everything from making sandwich bread from scratch and different kinds of treats and pastries and things like that and then in addition to that you will get one box of the cornflakes uh, from Air One and one box of the crispy brown rice gluten-free cereal from Air One too. So we will pick a random person from from uh, the participants of tonight. Yep. But everybody gets do I? Do we need a drum roll? <laughs> Everybody gets a coupon. So if you were here, there is this wonderful coupon. You have to go to Common Kindness, and um, I let's see, we're going to drop that into the event, and I will drop the URL to that coupon in the event, and you'll be able to access it for just today. Was that the choice? No, I think it's going to be it's going to be live um, throughout the rest of the month, I believe. So, yep. Okay. So, if you want to be able to go and get a box of cereal, any one box. Wow, this is a great coupon because then you can make the chicken cutlets or the chickpea casserole or any of the fun recipes. But I'll have it up on the event in just a minute. Yeah. Common Kindness, actually, so the coupon download, when you download the coupon, um, you also get to select a charity to give back some money um, through Common Kindness. So we actually think that's a pretty neat opportunity in terms of you get to save, and then you also get to give to a, a cause that you believe in um, just by downloading the coupon. So there is a little bit of a setup involved, but it's definitely worth it when you think of that. So, well... Yeah, that's great. I think we had fun. <laughs> I think we had fun, and you know, I would encourage you if you're not yet following um, Air One Organic on Pinterest, we have this fantastic gluten-free pantry staples board. Um, if you're even interested in pinning to the board, just leave a comment on there, and I'm happy to add you. Um, but I just want to give a big shout out to Jean and and a big thank you to all of you for attending. Um, tonight's HOA and I would encourage you to check out and stay tuned with Air One Organic throughout Celiac Awareness Month. We will have a Twitter chat coming up later in the month with Celiac and the Beast. We're also going to be doing a Twitter chat with the National Foundation for Celiac Awareness. So all of those dates and kind of information are on aironeorganic.com backslash blog. So it's all on the blog if you look for Celiac Awareness um, Month activities. And yeah, thank you so much for your questions. And Jean, you were this just is wealth of well. like pantry like and weeknight <laughs> cooking tips. Well, that's what happens when you ask a busy woman how she gets dinner on the table for a family of four. Um, this is the gluten-free pantry staples board, and I would encourage everyone just go on and and follow it because we'll keep adding to it over time, and it will be a great source for. All those things that you want to have tucked in the back of your refrigerator. That's right. So. And even like recipe ideas that are involving, again, those pantry staples. So it's what are other ways that I can use these lentils and things like that. So Exactly. 
And, you know, sometimes it's as simple as change out your flavoring by changing out whether you're using water or milk or nut milk or, you know, just change what you're using as the liquid and you've got a totally different meal. So tomato juice works really well, except don't try and cook your beans in tomato juice. That won't work so well. You have to yeah. use it afterwards. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Erin Leeds. I really appreciate the fun. Yep, and all of us at Air One Organic just want to um, wish everyone a, a good Seal Like Awareness Month. May all of us continue to raise awareness that gluten-free living um, is good and that you can thrive and just really, um, I don't know, even with food allergies, that it can be, it can be full of fun, inventive meals that are using those gluten-free pantry staples that are safe for everyone. Yeah. This way, there's no worry about feeding that food allergic, food allergic person. So, thanks so much. If, if you have friends that haven't, weren't able to make it, this is going to be live on the Air One uh, YouTube site uh, as, we, as we sign off or within a few minutes. So you can share it with your friends and let them hear all the tips and tricks. And... Uh, have a great night. Bye. Bye.